Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of Unit 2. We've now moved past all of the material that was going to be on Exam 1. And starting with Chapter 3, we're going to start working on material for Exam 2. Exam 2, which covers Unit 2, will focus on Chapters 3 and 4, both of which deal with the cell and cell activity. Chapter 26, which also deals with a very specific type of cell activity, metabolism and cellular respiration. And Chapter 5, which is going to focus on tissues. So this can kind of be thought of as our uh, microbiology unit. So let's go ahead and begin with our not really attendance questions. First, at what level of organization does life appear? If a molecule is polar, what does that mean? And are fatty acids hydrophilic or hydrophobic? So go ahead and try to answer these before going and listening to the answers. So hopefully you've paused the audio and listened or and, and figured out what these are. But let's see. At what level of organization does life appear? Life appears at the cellular level. Cells are the smallest unit of life. There are things smaller than cells, but they are not considered alive at that point. If a molecule is polar, what does that mean? Well, polar just means one area of something has different properties than another area of that same something. Such as, remember when we talked about water. Water was polar because one region of it was slightly positive, one region was slightly negative. So they were different. And are fatty acids hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Well, fatty acids, since they are fats, they're lipids. They don't like water. We say they are nonpolar. And nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic. They are water-fearing. They don't like water. Now, all three of these questions came from Unit 1, but they are going to be uh, important topics for much of what we're about to cover today and over the next couple of lectures. So, uh, as we mentioned in the very beginning, everything in this class kind of builds on previous material. So just because we've gotten past Exam 1 does not mean that we are through with that material. Now we're going to start to build on it and apply it. Now, I believe in the syllabus, I think I had uh, two lectures devoted to Chapter 3 and one lecture devoted to Chapter 4. I believe there's probably going to be three lectures devoted to Chapter 3, this first lecture. Instead of having it as one long lecture, I'm going to break it into two smaller ones. So... The first two lectures really count as one. I'm just breaking them into smaller chunks. So let's go ahead today, and we are going to talk about just the overview of the cell and talk briefly about the cell membrane as far as its structure. The second lecture is going to focus more on the activities of the cell membrane uh, and some transport across the membrane. Well, let's begin by talking just generally about cells. And cells, we've mentioned them back in chapter one. We said that they were the smallest unit of organization where uh, something is considered alive. And to build on that, we're going to talk about something called the cell theory. Cell theory uh, says a few things. First, it says that cells. Uh, compose all living things. All living things are composed of cells. Cells are the building block of all life. What does that mean? Every living thing, every living thing is composed of cells. If we found something and we looked at it with the right equipment and we saw that it was not made of cells, well, it's not alive. If we find something that we know for a fact is alive and we looked at it with 
the right equipment, we would see that it is made of cells. So cells are the building blocks of all life, and all living things are composed of cells. That's the first part of the cell theory. The next part of the cell theory says that all cells come from pre-existing cells. How does that work? Well, if there is a cell and we need growth or repair or something uh, in the body, that cell will actually go through something called mitosis or cell division. And that's going to be a topic for chapter four. But what really happens in, in a nutshell is that that cell will essentially make a copy of itself and split in half to make two brand new cells. And then those two cells will divide to make two of each, so four cells. And then those four cells will divide and keep going and going and going. But every one of those cells can be traced back to that first cell that we started with. All cells come from pre-existing cells. Cells don't just spontaneously appear. Every cell in your body can actually be traced back to the original fertilized egg. And that fertilized egg can be traced back to either egg from mom or sperm cell from dad. And those egg or sperm can be traced all the way back to, on mom's side, the original fertilized egg that turned into her, on dad's side, the original fertilized egg that turned into him, and so on and so on and so on. Every one of those cells came from a pre-existing cell. Now, cells are incredibly small. They are really, really small. With very few exceptions, you cannot see the cell with the naked eye. Now, in your body, you are composed of cells, obviously, and those cells are really small. So how many cells make you up? Well, different sources will give different ranges, typically ranging somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion cells. Now, the more accepted is 100 trillion. That's the most common that you hear. You are composed of about 100 trillion cells. But the really weird thing is, if we start looking at those cells that make you up, only one out of every 10 of those cells is human. The other nine cells out of every 10 are things like bacteria or uh, fungi or you know, various other things that just happen to live on or in your body. Most of them not doing any harm. There are so many bacteria in your body and on the surface of your body that are helpful and you couldn't live without them. But what that really means is only one of every 10 are human. That kind of means you are more not you than you are you. If you were to be put into a blender and broken down into 100 trillion individual cells, only one tenth of those cells is actually you. The other 90% are something else that just happened to be living on or in your body. This next bit, um, I'm going to kind of consider it self-study, but the reason that is is because right now it's not super important. When we get to chapter 4, these are going to be mentioned a lot more, and actually you have already seen these in lab when you did the tissues lab, which is what chapter 4 is going to be. So you've already come across uh, squamous or squamous, cuboidal, columnar, things like that. This is just to give you an idea of there are a lot of different shapes that cells can come in. A cell does not have a specific shape. Depending on the type of cell that it is, it will have a specific shape. But here's just kind of a broad overview of different cell shapes that you will see in the body. Up at the top, uh, we see the, the squamous or the squamous cells. Those tend to make things like membranes or the surface of your skin, places like that. 
cuboidal and columnar, those tend to be found in places that secrete or absorb substances. We will see all of these different shapes of cells throughout the semester, and we're not going to spend time going through every single one of these cell shapes right now. Now here is your book's drawing of a general cell. This is uh, in your textbook near the beginning of chapter 3. I believe it's figure 3.4 or something like that. But this is just a generalized cell. Now, obviously, as we just saw, cells aren't all going to have this same shape. Some of them will have more or less of certain structures inside the cell. This is just to give you an idea of there's a lot going on in a cell. So the general cell, there's going to be three component areas. And those three component areas are what's called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Now the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, that's just the outer boundary of the cell. It's not right to call it the cell wall because humans don't have cell walls. That's something that's found in plants and bacteria. But we can kind of think of it as a wall that forms the edge or the boundary of the cell. So the plasma membrane is the outer boundary of the cell. Cell membrane, plasma membrane, you will hear those two words interchangeable. Next. This big kind of purple ball here with the poke holes in it. This is called the nucleus. And if you've ever taken any biology classes in middle school or high school, you probably heard the nucleus called the control center of the cell or the brain of the cell or something like that. Now, the nucleus, its job is to protect and house the DNA. So if we were to look inside of a nucleus with the right kind of equipment, we would see kind of this hazy material inside, and that hazy material is the DNA along with some other substances that are there to protect the DNA. So the, the nucleus is there to contain and protect the DNA. Now we will see a lot more about the nucleus in this chapter and in chapter 4. Then we have all of the stuff inside the cell except for the nucleus, and that's called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm, in general, is the contents of the cell in between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. So when we look at this picture here, if it's not the plasma membrane, and if it's not the nucleus, then it's the cytoplasm. But we can look at that picture and see there's really a lot going on in the cytoplasm. So maybe we can be a little bit more specific. There are different parts to the cytoplasm. First, there's something called the cytosol. Inside the cell, there's a lot of liquid kind of like water, but it's not. But that liquid is called the cytosol. The cytosol is the liquid portion of the cytoplasm. Some other words that you may hear uh, that mean the same thing as cytosol are ICF, or intracellular fluid. The intracellular fluid, or the ICF, is the same thing as the cytosol, and that's just the liquid portion of the cytoplasm. Now we also see these larger structures. These are called organelles. We're going to spend a whole lecture on organelles coming up in this chapter. Organelles we mentioned back in chapter 1. Organelles are like the organs of the cell. They are small structures that perform very specific functions of the cell. Now, just like you have lungs and a stomach, uh, a liver, things like that, well, the cell has things like mitochondria and the Golgi apparatus and this smooth endoplasmic reticulum and all these different organelles that act like the organs of the cell. 
and we will talk about each of the organelles in a future lecture. We have the cytoskeleton. All these kind of look that look like little uh, sticks or threads inside the cell. Those are parts of the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton kind of gives support to the cell. It also allows things to move around inside the cell. We'll talk a lot about the cytoskeleton coming up. And finally, inclusions. Inclusions are just foreign matter, things that are not a part of the cell. They're foreign matter, or in some cases, they're things that the cell has made that the cell is storing. So inclusions are foreign matter and stored cell products. But then we have stuff outside the cell. Even though in a lot of cases the cells are packed really, really tightly together, in some places the cells are actually spread quite, quite far apart from each other. But in either case, there are substances outside of the cells, in between the cells. It's just some cases it's more extensive, in some cases it's less extensive. But all body fluids outside of the cells are called the extracellular fluid, or ECF. Some other words that you may hear are interstitial fluid or tissue fluid. All of these mean the same thing. I am more fond of interstitial fluid, especially when we get to bio-139, but ECF, extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid, and tissue fluid they all mean the same thing. It's just the fluid, the liquid, outside of and between the cells. Now here's a, a table from your book, Table 3.1, and I am not expecting you to know any of these sizes. This is just to give you an idea of how big some of the structures that we're going to be talking about in the next few lectures actually are. And one that I want to kind of draw your eye to up here is the human egg. Now, if we look in this blue bar right here, it says, visible to the naked eye, the smallest thing that human eyes are capable of seeing without something like a magnifying glass or a microscope, just the unaided eye can see things as small as maybe 70 to 100 microns or micrometers. That is really, really small. And the human egg is the largest cell in the body. The human egg is about 100 micrometers. So it's kind of right there, just barely big enough for us to see. We can see the human egg with the unaided eye. But every other cell in the body, much too small to be seen with the naked eye. We can see the average cell here, most human cells, are about 10 to 15 micrometers. So they are really, really small. But again, you do not have to know these. This is just to give you an idea of how big some of these things are. So let's now talk about the plasma membrane, or the cell membrane. Remember, the plasma membrane was what formed the outer boundary of the cell. And we can kind of think of the cell membrane, it holds the stuff in the cell that is supposed to stay in, and it holds the stuff out of the cell that's supposed to stay out. But let's be a little bit more specific with the functions. It defines the boundary, it acts as the wall of the cell, keeping stuff in or out as needed. It governs interactions. So certain cells need to be able to communicate with each other, either by direct contact. Some cells in your body move around, like your immune system. When the cell from your immune system comes along to one of your cells, they will communicate with each other. They'll interact. Or in some cases, Hormones sent from one cell will travel through your blood to a completely different part of your body. And 
by using those hormones, those two cells that are very, very far apart from each other are still able to communicate, to interact with each other. And selective permeability. So this kind of ties in with the defining the boundary part. Cells are selectively permeable. Some things need to stay inside the cell, and some things need to stay outside the cell. And the plasma membrane is really good at keeping those things in or out. But there are some things that need to be able to come into the cell or to leave the cell. So the cell has to be able to allow certain things in or out. And it's not just willy-nilly. It's not anything can get in or out. The cell can actually select what it is permeable to. If something needs to get into or out of the cell, then there are going to be components of the plasma membrane that that substance can actually pass through. The cell is selectively permeable. Certain things can get in or out. Other things cannot. Now, let's talk about what the membrane is made of. And we see kind of a picture of a membrane here. This is from your textbook. I think it's figure 3.5. Up at the top, this is an actual microscopic image of two cells. This dark area are the plasma membranes of two cells. Everything below is one cell. Everything above is another cell. Now, when we look at the plasma membrane, we can see that it's made of a lot of different stuff. We see these big purple things. We see these small blue things. We see these kind of yellowish things and these green things. Lots of different pieces make this plasma membrane. And that gives us something that has been termed the fluid mosaic model. When we talk about the plasma membrane, we say that it is a fluid mosaic. So before we talk any further about these structures, let's see what that term fluid mosaic model actually means. Who knows what a mosaic is? Typically, I, I like to ask that question in class just to see if there are any artists in the class who might know what a mosaic is. Well, a mosaic is, uh, it's, a picture that when you look at it, maybe you see a person's face or a landscape or something. But if you get closer to it and you look really, really close, it's actually lots of little tiny pieces, typically of paper, like tissue paper or something like that, that has been glued to a canvas. And those little tiny pieces on their own don't look like anything. But if you back up, then they're arranged in a way that makes a picture that looks like a person or looks like a house or whatever. So it's lots of little pieces that work together to make something bigger. And that's how the membrane is. Lots of little pieces that work together to make this boundary. Well, what does the fluid side of it mean? Well, water is a fluid. Air is a fluid. Oil is a fluid. Fluid is just something that can flow. It can move around pretty freely. And all of these pieces of the plasma membrane, even though they look like they're stuck together, which they kind of are, there's some freedom of movement. Let's pretend this is an actual photograph of a cell membrane down here at the bottom. We took a photograph. Let's say we come back two hours later and we take a photograph of the same spot. Well, a lot of these players that make up the plasma membrane will have moved, will have shifted places. All of these purple things, they're kind of free to move around. These yellow things and these blue things, they're free to move around. So even though they are individual pieces that are working together to make this membrane, they have freedom of movement, so they're not completely locked in place. It is fluid. And that's why we call this the fluid mosaic model. 
Now, when we look at this membrane, by far, most of what we're looking at are lipids. We kind of mentioned that near the end of chapter two when we were talking organic biochemistry and macromolecules. Lipids make up the vast majority of the plasma membrane, about 98% of it. So almost, almost 100% of the membrane is made of some form of lipid. Now, when we look at these lipids, again, which make up about 98% of the plasma membrane, there's different types of lipids in the plasma membrane. About 75% of that 98% are phospholipids. We talked about the phospholipids back in chapter two. Those are the ones that I said will kind of look like a tadpole with the two tails. Well, that's these yellowish guys. We can see there's the head and the two tails, lots of them. So 98% of the membrane are lipids, and of that 98%, 75% of that 98% are phospholipids. Now, when we look at the phospholipids, again, remember the structure from chapter two. We said the head was polar, and the fatty acid tails that we talked about in chapter two and in the not really attendance questions, the tails are non-polar. So the whole molecule itself is polar because it has different regions with different properties. Now, that's the structure, but let's talk about the orientation. Remember outside the cell? What is there outside the cell? There's the extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid is mostly what? It's mostly water. Inside the cell. What's inside the cell? Well, there's cytosol, and the cytosol is mostly what? It's mostly water. Now, polar heads, polar molecules in general, the polar heads, they're going to be attracted to water. And the nonpolar tails, they're hydrophobic. They don't like water, so they're going to be repelled by water. So the heads, the polar heads, they're going to face outward towards that extracellular fluid because they like water, correct? But that leaves a problem. The tails, if the tails point inward towards the intracellular fluid, what's the issue? They don't like water, so they're going to be repelled. They're going to try to face out. But when they face out, they're exposed to the extracellular fluid, which again is a problem. So how do we move these, these uh, phospholipids so that the heads are facing the water and the tails are not? What we have to do is make them two layers. And if we make them two layers, the heads can face inward and outward. The heads can face towards the extracellular fluid and towards the intracellular fluid. And at the same time, the nonpolar tails that don't like water, the hydrophobic tails, they're hidden from the water. They're sandwiched in between the polar heads. And that's what we see here. The head groups face the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. The fatty acid tails are sandwiched. They're hidden away. So we can think of the membrane as like a, a peanut butter sandwich. The bread being the hydrophilic or the polar head groups. This is the bread down here, another layer of bread. The peanut butter sandwiched in between. That way the heads face water and the tails are hidden from the water, just like polar and nonpolar molecules would want to be. So because of this, the membrane, even though it's one layer as a single membrane, it's actually two layers thick. So what we will often hear this called is a phospholipid bilayer. A phospholipid bilayer. Bi means two, 
so two layers of phospholipids. The membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, 20%, give or take, of that 98% is going to be these blue guys here, cholesterol. We talked a little bit about cholesterol in Chapter 2. We said that cholesterol gets a bad rap. Every time we think about cholesterol, we think how horrible it is for our heart and our liver. But we also said that cholesterol has a place in the body that we need a certain amount of it. We couldn't go without cholesterol. Here's one of the reasons why it's so important. It actually fits in and makes part of this plasma membrane. And in doing so, we say that it reduces the fluidity of the membrane. It does a couple of things. It fits in between these fatty acid tails and keeps them from causing too much fluidity. We want everything to be able to move around a little bit, but we don't want it to just completely fall apart, which could potentially happen. The cholesterol reduces the fluidity just a little bit. Now, the final about 5% are things called glycolipids. Glyco means sugar or carb, carbohydrate. Lipid, of course, means lipids. These green guys here, some of these green guys are attached to, in some cases like we see here, the phosphate head group, the, the polar head. But really, more realistically, they're actually attached to these fatty acid tails in most cases. Some of them are attached to these purple guys. We'll talk about those later because those are something different. But when we have a carbohydrate chain attached to lipids, it's called a glycolipid. Now, keep those in mind. I'm not going to talk about what they do just yet because we're going to come back to them here in a few slides and talk about those glycolipids when we talk about these other green guys over here attached to the purple. So glycolipids, carbohydrate chains attached to a lipid, and we'll come back to those. Now we're moving away from membrane, uh, membrane lipids, and we're going to talk about membrane proteins. Membrane proteins. When we looked at that picture before, all those big purple blobs, those represented the membrane proteins. So here are some more membrane proteins. And when we talk about membrane proteins, they're going to fall into two categories. They're going to be transmembrane proteins, or sometimes they're called integral proteins. All that means is they are actually built into the membrane itself. They cross at least a portion of the membrane. Here we see two membranes that go all the way from the outside edge all the way through the middle to the inside edge. Sometimes you may see them that go through about halfway or from the other side through about halfway. Those are still going to be integral proteins. The other class is a peripheral protein. Peripheral proteins sit just inside or just outside. So, uh, like this pink guy right here. Here, this is a peripheral protein. It sits just on the inside of the membrane. Sometimes there are some it doesn't show here that sit just on the outside. So, do they penetrate the protein? I mean, the, the, does the protein penetrate? The membrane or not. If it does, it's integral. If it doesn't, it's peripheral. Now, proteins, remember back when we were looking at proteins in chapter two and I was telling all the different things that they do, they were pretty, pretty broad as far as what they could do. They were the most 
prolific uh, as far as ter uh, terms of jobs that they could do. They could do lots of different things. That was because they came in so many different shapes. And it was all about shapes when we talked about proteins. Well, that's no different when we're going to talk about proteins that are part of the cell membrane. There are lots of different types. Well, for example, over here on the left, we see one thing that they could do is act as a receptor. When we get to bio 139 and we're talking about the endocrine system, hormones that will come along and communicate with a cell, the way that they communicate in many instances is by attaching to a membrane protein. If the shape fits, it attaches and we get some form of communication. Next, enzymes. Well, we've already talked in chapter two about enzymes. Remember, enzymes were catalysts that caused a reaction to happen faster than it would otherwise. Well, those enzymes could be floating around in the cell or they could be a part of the cell membrane. Here we can see that this catalyst is breaking down whatever this triangle guy is here. I guess over here we said it was a hormone. Well, this enzyme is going to break this hormone down. Next, proteins can be channels. A channel is basically a pass, passageway through a cell membrane. And those channels, there's going to be a few different types. Uh, for example, there's something called a leaky channel, which looks like what we have right here. A leaky channel is a channel that is always open, and a substance can pass through that channel freely. Now, what can pass through that channel? Let's go back to protein shape. Remember, a protein shape allows it to do one job very well based on that shape. Well, when there is a protein for a uh, functioning as a leaky channel, it's going to be shaped so that one specific thing can get through it. For example, there are things in your cell membrane called potassium leaky channels. In that case, it's an open channel, and potassium, but only potassium, can pass through it. If there was something else like sodium that needed in or out of the cell, it could not pass through a potassium channel. It would have to have a sodium channel. Some channels we say are gated. And gated channels means that sometimes they're open and sometimes they're closed. So things can only pass through them while they are in their open state. And there are different types of gated channels. The thing that makes them different is what is it that causes them to open or close? For example, there's something called a ligand gated channel, which is also sometimes called a chemically gated channel. A ligand is just something that attaches itself to a protein to cause it to change shape. So a ligand gated channel or chemically gated channel is a channel that is closed, and then when a specific ligand attaches to it, it opens. And then when the ligand is removed, it closes again. So it's kind of like a lock and key. The ligand being the key, the channel itself being the lock. It will only open if the specific key is inserted or attached. There's also something called a voltage-gated channel. These are going to be important when we talk about nerves and muscles. The inside of your cell compared to the outside of your cell, every cell in your body, will have a specific charge difference called a voltage. Right now it's not super important to know, but I'll just go ahead and say the inside of every cell in your body is a little bit negative compared to the outside of that cell. And if we measure the difference, if we measure how negative the inside is compared to the outside, then it's going to have a certain voltage number. 
voltage gated channels open and close in response to changes in that voltage. At certain measurements, they're open. At certain measurements, they're closed. Those are voltage gated channels. We'll talk about those in the next lecture and then again when we talk about nerves and muscles. There are mechanically gated channels that open and close in response to just physical deformation, such as pressure. If something pushes on one of them, on, on a uh, mechanically gated channel, it will physically cause it to bend in such a way that it opens. That's actually how your sense of touch works, for example. When you press on something, it causes these mechanically gated channels to open. We can have uh, carriers that are similar to channels called pumps. Pumps allow things to move through, except it uses energy. It uses ATP to move something through it. That, so when you hear something called a pump, think, well, if you're using a water pump, you have to put some energy into pumping it to cause the water to come out. Well, cellular pumps require energy in the form of ATP for something to move through it. Next, cell identity markers. These are proteins that will have something like a carbohydrate chain attached to it, or in some cases, just a protein itself, but there's a very specific shape to this protein or uh, protein carbohydrate complex that your immune system uses to recognize your cells versus foreign cells. Because these cell identity markers are unique to the individual. These proteins and protein carbohydrates on the surface of your cells are completely different from every other living thing on the planet unless you have an identical twin or a clone. In those cases, they will be the same. Other than that, they are differently shaped for everyone. And that's part of how your immune system works, is by looking at the shape of those proteins or protein carbohydrate complexes. Over here we have something called cell adhesion molecules, or CAMs. And what we're seeing here is one cell has a CAM sticking off of it. We see the edge of another cell with a CAM sticking off of it. And those two cams grab hold of each other and lock. So it allows these two cells to bind to each other, to hold on to each other. And finally, we have something called the second messenger system. And this kind of ties in to that uh, cell communication or interaction that we talked about earlier. In some cases, when a hormone or a chemical of some sort attaches to a receptor, it's going to trigger something called the second messenger system. And I'm going to just briefly talk about this, but then there's going to be a video on the next slide. So when the hormone, let's just call it a hormone, when the hormone attaches to a specific receptor, and remember it can only attach to a receptor that has the right shape, when it attaches, now we've added something to that protein. What happens any time we add something to or take something away from a protein? It changes shape and it changes properties. So we add something. This changes shape. And it changes shape so that something that it was holding on to down here called a G protein, well, it lets go of it. And the G protein starts to move. And eventually, it will move until it joins with this next protein called adenylate cyclase. When this G protein gets there, well, the G protein and the adenylate cyclase like each other. They attach to each other. 
And when they attach, it causes this reaction that takes a molecule of ATP and breaks it apart. And one of the things that it breaks apart into is something called cyclic AMP, or CAMP. The CAMP is the second messenger that we're getting the name of this process from. And the CAMP is kind of like knocking over a domino. Once we get to this point, it converts one thing into another. Now that thing could be lots of different stuff, but it converts one thing into another. And then this new thing converts one thing into another. And it's like knocking over domino after domino after domino after domino until in the end we get some sort of effect. You do not need to know the full details. What I would like you to know from this is there is a hormone or chemical of some sort that acts as a first messenger that attaches itself to a receptor. When that happens, the receptor changes shape, and that ultimately triggers this domino effect that results in changes inside the cell at the end. So here, again, I'm not sure on your end if you will be able to hear the sound once I click play. It's going to show what we just talked about. If you can't hear the sound, it is embedded in your uh, PowerPoint on Blackboard. All right, so now, again, I'm sorry if that didn't play sound, but I think it doesn't. So that's why I load it onto your all's PowerPoints. Now we're going to talk about those green carbohydrate chains that we've kind of ignored so far. Some of them we saw were attached to uh, the, the lipids, and they were called glycolipids. Some of them are attached to those purple blobs, those proteins. And in that case, they're called glycoproteins. So glycolipids and glycoproteins. Now, collectively, they are called the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx, there's several different functions listed here. And there's kind of some overlap as far as what do the glycolipids do versus what do the glycoproteins do. I would like you to know collectively these things kind of in general. But more importantly, what I would like you to know are most of the time glycolipids are involved in anchorage for the cell. The carbohydrate chains are sticky. And if they are attached on one end to the lipids that make up most of the cell membrane, the other end is free to kind of grab onto proteins or other substances that may be out here in the extracellular fluid. And it's anchoring the cell in place. Now, glycoproteins, they're coming off of the proteins. Again, remember, proteins shape, very specific shape. And the glycoproteins attached to those or the glycos attached to those proteins are going to tie into that shape. And that is what we were talking about a moment ago with the immune system. And yours are shaped different than your neighbors are shaped different from your dogs are shaped different from the tree are shaped different from everybody else on the planet, unless you have a twin or a clone. So your immune system comes along and looks at those glycoproteins or just at the proteins in general looks to see what shape are they. Hopefully it sees that they are your shape and it moves on. 
if it comes across a bacteria that is harmful to you, it will recognize that as foreign and it will start to fight it off. So even though there is a lot of overlap, glycolipids usually are involved in anchorage. Glycoproteins usually are involved in identity. And we will wrap up this lecture with talking about some extensions of the cell surface. Now, I could not find a good picture that showed all of the extensions that I want to talk about, so I've kind of drawn one here. Let me explain what it is that I've drawn. The blue kind of squarish shaped thing is just a cell. And then the black circle with the squiggly inside is the nucleus with the DNA inside. And on each side of this cell, I've drawn a different extension. Up at the top are microvilli. Microvilli are actual extensions and folds of the plasma membrane itself. So these are, these are microvilli. And typically, when we see microvilli, there are lots of them arranged in an area called the brush border of the cell. And the purpose of microvilli is to increase the surface area of this cell. For example, if we were to just start at this top left corner and measure to the top right corner, it's, you know, however many inches it appears on your monitor. But if instead we were to count how many inches it is, including the ups and downs of all of these folds, well, it's a lot longer than just from this corner to this corner. We've increased the surface area. And that's important because all along these microvilli are things like those proteins that we just looked at, maybe channels, maybe. Uh, pumps, maybe whatever. So there's a lot more room here for things to move either into or out of the cell. Next over here on the left are cilia. And sometimes under a microscope, cilia and microvilli can look really, really similar. But they're not really that much alike. In cilia, these are little protrusions, almost like hair, sticking off of the cell. Now, it's not hair, but that's kind of what it can resemble. They are not extensions of the plasma membrane. They're not folds of plasma membrane the way the microvilli were. These are structures growing off of the cell membrane, kind of like hair grows off of your head. The hair is not folds of skin. The hair is something growing from your skin. So the cilia are extensions growing from the plasma membrane. And cilia, most of the time, are used to move something across the surface of the cell. For example, down your trachea, the tube that goes towards your lungs, it is lined with cilia. And if you ever breathe something in, dust or something, it's going to get caught in mucus in your trachea. And those cilia are constantly in motion, brushing and brushing and brushing, moving that mucus up so that it gets to the back of your throat and triggers you to cough. And then you can cough out whatever you just breathed in. Now, here's where I always take a moment to caution people against smoking, because smokers actually burn off that cilia, and they burn off the, the things that produce that mucus, so that if you do breathe something in, it goes straight down into your lungs. If you stop smoking, those cilia and those mucus glands will start to function again. But the cilia for the most part, their function is to wave and move substances across the surface of the cell. Down here, 
we see something called a flagellum. Flagella is when there are more than one. Flagellum is when it is single. Most of the time we have a single flagellum when there is a cell that has one. But in the human body, there's only one single cell that has a flagellum, and that's the sperm cell. So males will have sperm cells with flagella, and females, none of their cells have flagella. Flagella are similar to cilia in that they are just things growing from the cell itself. They are not made of plasma membrane. They are just growing from the plasma membrane. But in the case of cilia, there are lots of them, and they are really short. In a flagellum, there's one in some other cell, uh, other organisms, you may see a few flagella. But in humans, one flagellum, and it is really long. So cilia, lots and short. Flagella, one and long. And the job is different. Remember, cilia moved substances across the cell? Well, flagella, when they move, it propels the cell itself. So it's kind of like it, the tail, the flagellum of the sperm, causes the sperm cell to swim. It moves the entire cell. And the last cell extension we will talk about are these guys right here. These are called pseudopods. Pseudopod literally means false foot. And even though I've drawn it like this, they don't always look like this. They will move. It's the membrane extends itself and the rest of the cell kind of follows with it. And as the cell follows with it, the pseudopod extends itself even more. So it's almost like the cell is using the pseudopods to crawl, to move around. And why might it move around? Well, the cells in your body that do this the most often are white blood cells. White blood cells are part of your immune system. And pseudopods are primarily used to move a cell around and for something called phagocytosis. Let's draw a little bacteria. Well, the pseudopods will wrap around the bacteria, basically allowing the cell to eat the bacteria. So the pseudopods allow a cell to move, and they allow for something called phagocytosis. All right, we will talk more about phagocytosis in the next lecture. So that's going to be where we end today. The next lecture is going to talk a little bit more about functions of the cell membrane. And then the final lecture of chapter three will talk about the organelles of the cell and their functions. All right, so there's, even though there's only two mentioned in the syllabus, there will be three lectures for chapter three. All right, if you have any questions, let me know, and I will talk to you next time.